Here's a, this is a song we haven't done in a while, and if you can clap on rhythm, I would encourage you to clap your hands to this one. Never mind, man. Not gonna happen. Yeah. I know he rescued my soul. His blood's covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. My pain is in His name. I believe. I believe. I'll raise a banner. My Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer. Lives. My Redeemer. Okay, you can be seen. She said no. And I said, I am. And so she's been holding my hand up here on the front row, keeping me calm. So I appreciate that. Oh, I want to ask Evelyn a question. And Jim, do you think that 40 years ago, when you drug me to Sunday school for the very first time, that you think that uh, you'd see me and your granddaughter standing up here. God works in some pretty strange ways sometimes, do um, That's pretty awesome, I think. And I'll ask David a question. I'm going to put everybody on the spot real quick. Only person I've ever baptized in my life was my first cousin, David's little girl. And now I'm baptizing my first cousin, David's little girl. Just a different one. So that's pretty cool. So, I want to ask this one question. You stand right here. Sarah, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Say it loud. Say that bunch can hear you out there. Yes. Alright. So. Let me ask uh, Sarah Barton. Okay? Alright, there's all your family standing, okay? Alright. Sarah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Good morning. Uh, it's a, all, as always, it's a it's an honor and it's a privilege when we get to celebrate in baptism. That means someone has given their life to Christ. And um, this is Jim Nichols, and he he told me just a minute ago that this Easter is when he accepted Christ. So Easter changed his life. Jim, I told you I'd ask you a couple of questions. Um, Jim, have you admitted that you're a sinner and that you needed a Savior? Yes, I have. I and have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life and to be the Lord and Savior of your life? And do you commit to Him today and before these people that you'll live for Him for the rest of your life? Yes, I do. Jim, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's kind of the cool part. This is Misty Nichols, his wife. Um, Uh, it, it's it's just wonderful to see how God moves in a family when He transforms a family. Um, and Misty has been a Christian for years, but she never followed Jesus in baptism. So today you get the chance to do that. I'm going to ask you the same questions. Okay. Uh, Misty, have you admitted that you're a sinner and in need of a Savior? I have. And have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life as your Lord and Savior? Every day. And you commit to him today and before these people that you'll live for him for the rest of your life. I do. Misty, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful. We're thankful for your birthday simple fact that you continue to change lives or that you minister to people and that you uh, continue to offer that free gift of salvation and Lord we're just so thankful that we can celebrate today together with the Nichols family Lord I pray that you'll just continue to lead and guide them and help them Lord as, as they start their new lives in you God I pray that we as a church would minister to them and love them and help them along the way Lord, thank you for this day and for this honor to be here to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's great to see those two. I, I really enjoyed hearing her conviction in her voice when she answered those questions. Let's stand together and worship the Lord again this morning. We'll be studying from Romans 8 this morning. This song is birthed out of Romans 8, 28. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercy for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know. strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone in these open seas. Your love never fails. 
chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails 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 You make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good I know you make all things work together for my good I know you make all things work together for my good and You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Your love never fails. Your love never fails. Your love never fails, your love never fails, your love never fails. You make all things work together for my good. I know you make all things work together for my good. I know you make all things work together for my good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have our best interests at heart. Even when we want to do things that are not in those best interests, Lord, that are not within your will and within your plan. Thank you for your spirit that guides us, Lord, and if we're believers, convicts us. Pray this morning that you'd speak to us through your word and that uh, we'd apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Father saw in the days of old and to do it again I do it again all the stories told of the miracle and to do it again I do it again and you said God's crazy to me
said, consecrates itself to me. You'll see amazing things. But we need your revival, Holy Spirit fire, burning ever brighter in our souls. Kings and kingdoms fall. We've seen it time and time and again, a courtroom scene. Someone is being charged with a crime, and the lawyers parade the witnesses in and out. Their very testimonies have the power to swing the pendulum of fate. The jury, they sit and they listen and they deliver a verdict, and then the judge slams down the gavel and declares a sentence. But what about you? Is the jury still out on you? Do you live this day in and day out existence as though someone has handed you a guilty verdict? It feels like we live the good parts and the bad parts of our lives, 
as though they're on a set of scales. And inevitably, the bad stuff, it always seems the heaviest. In John chapter 8, we find a woman that was literally dragged out of bed with the man that she was having an affair with. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, she was caught in the act. We know nothing about her past. We have no idea if this was a long-standing affair and she just really didn't feel bad about it anymore. Or, or maybe she had a cruel husband and she felt depressed and all of a sudden here comes this man that just finds her fascinating. Regardless, the two of them, in a fit of passion, make this huge mistake. And she had no idea that she was gonna be torn from that bed, thrown into public, probably naked, to tumble upon the feet of Jesus, and her accusers want Jesus to judge her. Can you imagine the tape that was playing in her mind that day? Oh, what have I done? I can't believe I keep making the same mistakes. Look at these people judging me, mocking me. I've gone too far. I have gone way too far for God to ever love a screw-up like me. Those are real thoughts. And if I'm honest, there's been a good portion of my life where I felt like my soul has been in the courtroom. Not that I was thrown in front of a large crowd where all my sins lay naked for the whole world to see. But I know what I've done. I have dark secrets just like you. I have declared myself guilty. How does guilt manifest itself in everyday life? Have you ever been given a compliment but you just brush it off? Has anyone ever tried to break through that tough exterior to show you love but your wall is so high there's just no way anyone can get through? and you find yourself yet again alone. Shame and guilt are powerful prisons. But it doesn't have to be that way. There is no jury declaring you guilty. Our innocence is found in Christ. The only sentence you have is found in Romans chapter 8 that says, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those would be the words that would change this woman's life forever. But before she heard those words, she heard Jesus say as he looked at the crowd, if any of you have never made a mistake, if you are perfect, go ahead and start throwing rocks. And Jesus looked at this woman and said, woman, where is your jury? Who's condemning you? And the woman looked around and everybody was gone. And she looked at Jesus. She said, no one, no one is condemning me. And then Jesus looked at the woman and said, well, I don't condemn you either. Go, go and sin no more. Can you imagine the look on this woman's face when she realized her sentence? Not guilty. And we have been given the same verdict. Aren't you tired of beating yourself up over your past? When are you going to stop being judge and jury and even executioner of your own life? Because if you look in the jury box, no one is there. And if you go to the judge's bench, no one is swinging a gavel declaring your condemnation. And there's not going to be any surprise witnesses coming in at the last minute to bring up embarrassments from your past. You are free. Can you relate to that? You know, I think one of the things that um, absolutely determines our spiritual lives and just our lives in general is uh, what we do with the concept that's presented in that video and what we're going to see in, in, in God's Word today. 
I think all of us have this loop in our minds where we tend to rehearse every way we failed, all the ways that we've sinned, all the ways that we've blown it, you know, things from our past, all the ways that we fall short, all the ways that we don't measure up. But the reality is, in Christ, all of that is taken away. And so what we're going to see today, okay, really, today's message is a one-point message, okay? You remember one thing, right? It's really not even a one-point message because the point we're going to look at over two weeks. So it's like half a point. So surely, you, you know, we can, we can all get half a point, I hope. But uh, the, the main idea of the message that we're going to see in the Scripture, I think it was really expressed in that video, is that the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that paid the penalty for our sins frees us from all condemnation. And it sets us free to be able to actually obey God, to actually be able to live a righteous life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we get into Romans chapter 8, over the next five weeks, really going to look at is how God blesses us, how God works in in our lives uh, out of the fact that we're in Christ. So today we're going to look at the idea of no condemnation. Next week we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit works. And then we're going to look at the fact that we're children of God. We're going to see how God gives us hope in suffering. And, and we're going to see at the end of the chapter how, like the song that we sang, that God is for us and nothing can ever separate us from His love. That's what we have. That's who we are if we're in Christ. So really, there's two things you've got to determine today. Number one, you've got to see whether or not you're in Christ. Because the reality is, if you're not in Christ, you are under the judgment and condemnation of God. But if you're in Christ, all of that has been removed. But if we're in Christ, then the thing that we have to believe, the thing that we have to act on, is that that is really true. We have to live that way. Because, you know, we, a lot of times we can you know, have the right theology, we can come to church and sing or say the right thing, you know, that all my sins are taken away, but then that's not how we live day to day. We tend uh, to go back to things from the past, or even when we do sin in our day to day lives, there's a question then of how do we respond? Do we go back to the cross, or do we beat ourselves up? I think we tend to beat ourselves up but I said this in one of the services last week, we don't need to beat ourselves up because Jesus was beaten for us. By His stripes, we're healed. And so, are we going to live according to God's Word, according to His truth? Are we going to live according to the lies of the enemy? Because this is how Satan works. Right? On the front end, Satan tempts us. Now, Temptation doesn't make us do anything. The Bible says we sin when we're enticed and led astray by our own desires. Right? But if, say, if we have a temptation that meets our desire, if we sin, Satan on the front end tempts us. On the back end, Satan then condemns us. That's how he works. and It becomes this cycle. Uh, he tempts, we give in, then he condemns us, tells us how awful we are, which the more that we think that way, then the more likely we are to give in to temptation, and it becomes this vicious cycle, and that's where a lot of people live. And, and what, what we need to see in God's Word today is there's freedom. That Jesus wants to set us free from all of that. Now, maybe the first thing we, we have to address, like I say, just one idea, that in Christ, that we're set free through His finished work from all condemnation. So the question would be, is, is condemnation, is judgment a real thing? Um, you know, a lot of people would say today that God, you know, God doesn't judge people. God doesn't condemn people. God is just love. But hopefully, one of the things you've gotten from the book of Romans is that, that, that God is a righteous judge who, out of His holy nature, has to deal with all sin. Right? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We read in Romans 1.18 that the, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of mankind. God is righteously angry with every sin. Not some sin, all sin. Not somebody else's sin, 
my sin. God does judge people. Um, in, in John chapter 3, the, the Bible says that he who believes in Jesus Christ has eternal life, but he who does not believe in him, the wrath of God abides on him. And, and so, really, we either have life, freedom, uh, forgiveness in Christ, or if we're rejecting Christ, we stand under the judgment of God. It, as, and what I'm saying is, is that it's an objective reality. Now, there's subjective things, there's feelings of guilt and all that kind of thing that we have to deal with as well, but, but what I'm saying is that their judgment is, <coughs> excuse me, an objective reality. You say, well, you know, I don't believe that. I just believe that God is love and that um, nobody should judge anybody or anything. Well, let me push back on that for just a minute and get you to think for just a second. Would you actually want to live in a world where there were no righteous moral judgments? What kind of world would that be? It would be complete anarchy. Right? It would be survival of the fittest. Might makes right. That's why we cry out for justice. So I, I would say that judgment is actually a reality. You know, the test of any worldview of any belief system, does it correspond to reality? Nobody wants to live without righteous judgment. Even beyond that, e even people who say, oh, we shouldn't judge, don't judge, you know, if, if you judge, you're a bigot, all these kind of things. Nobody actually lives that way. Right? Who doesn't make moral judgments? You can't live that way. You know, people say you can't legislate morality. Well, it, that's half true. You can't legislate morality in the sense of making people actually act in a moral way, but you can legislate morality. Every law at its basis has a moral judgment. You can't have a civilized society without that. Everybody judges. I mean, the, the, when people say that, don't believe that kind of stuff. The question is, is, is what are you judging? Why are you judging it? And how do you actually know what's right and what's wrong? And, and, and I would say, for me, these things are one of the reasons to believe in God. To me, the idea of a conscience, the idea that everybody believes in some type of right and wrong, that everybody makes some kind of judgments implies that we have a soul. And if we have a soul, we're not just material, phys uh, physical beings, we're immaterial, spiritual beings, which would assume then that we're made in the image of an immaterial, spiritual God, which would indicate that there actually is a God. Someone who believes in naturalism and humanism, who believes that the world is a closed universe, that there's nothing outside of us, nothing beyond us, we just evolved, we somehow came from nothing, or the universe is eternal. Uh, I mean, the, the logical end result of that is, is atheism. I mean, if we have no soul, this life is all there is. But what I'm saying is we have a conscience, if we actually make judgments, then that would imply we do have a soul which would imply that there is a God who actually created us. And if God actually created us, then as creator, he is also righteous judge. And someday, we will have to answer to him. So, even throw the Bible out for just a minute. I think if you want to argue that you'll never stand in, in the judgment of God, you're making a pretty big leap of being that's not really logical if you kind of play it all the way through to its in conclusion so there is such a thing as judgment there there is such a thing as, as condemnation and so outside of christ we stand under the judgment of god but we're going to see in romans 8 1 this great phrase that's used so much in the new testament that we are in christ that that's our position, that our life is hidden with Him, that we're in this union with Him, that we stand in relation to Him. Martin Luther explained it this way. He said, faith unites the soul with Christ as a spouse with her 
husband. That's why in Ephesians 5 that uh, marriage is used as, a, as an analogy, as a picture of the gospel. It says, everything which Christ has becomes the property of the believing soul. Everything which the soul has becomes the property of Christ. Christ possesses all blessings and eternal life. They are henceforward the property of the soul. The soul has all its iniquities and sins. They become thenceforward the property of Christ. It is then that a blessed exchange commences. Christ who is both God and man, Christ who has never sinned and whose holiness is perfect, Christ the Almighty and Eternal, taking to Himself by His nuptial ring of faith all the sins of the believer. Those sins are lost and abolished in Him, for no sin dwells before His infinite righteousness. Thus by faith the believer's soul is delivered from sins and clothed with the eternal righteousness of the bridegroom, Christ. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's the great exchange. Our sin, we're going to see later, the curse of the law for all of the blessings that belong to Jesus Christ. That's what happens to us when we're in Him. Robert Mounts has put it this way, uh, commenting on Romans 8. He says, The just penalty incurred by the sins of the human race was paid by the death of Christ. The unfavorable verdict has been removed. Now all those who are in Christ are the beneficiaries of that forgiveness. Listen, it follows that if condemnation as an objective reality has been removed, there is no legitimate place for condemnation as a subjective experience. To insist on feeling guilty is but another way of insisting on helping God with our salvation. How deeply embedded in human nature is the influence of works righteousness. Do you understand that? Whenever we live in guilt, if we're a Christian, we're not fully appreciating, not fully trusting what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're still trying to help God save us in some way by feeling guilty because, you know, sometimes we live in guilt because it just makes us feel better. It's like a form of penance, basically. Or, or, or we do these things, and, and when we do things to try to make ourselves feel better or try to make ourselves more accepted or more righteous in God's sight, that's not resting in the finished work of Christ. That is a form of works righteousness. So, what, we're, what, what I'm saying is, what, the, what we're going to see in Scripture here is God is a righteous judge. When we're in Christ, though, because Christ took God's righteous judgment, because He was condemned in our place, there is no condemnation, and, and we're forgiven, we have a relationship with God, and when we believe that and live based on that day, in our day-to-day -day lives, then we're also set free, we're set free from guilt and, and, and fear, and set free from trying to make ourselves right in God's sight and we're free to enjoy our salvation we're free to, to feel the love of God and see ourselves as a child of God and live to bring him glory based on what he has done for us instead of us spending our lives trying to earn something that Jesus has already earned for us God wants us to live by his grace you say well when I sin I mean shouldn't I feel bad about it yeah, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God still disciplines us as a parent, as a loving father does, e even, even though he doesn't judge us, even though he doesn't condemn us, even though he's never going to send us to hell, we're never going to lose our salvation. But the, here's the difference. Conviction was never meant to make us feel bad about who we are in Christ. Conviction was meant to bring us to repentance, not to cause us to focus on ourselves, but to cause us to go back to the cross so our fellowship with God can be restored, so we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, so we can walk with Him, but it's never about our relationship with Him. Listen, the Holy Spirit, when He speaks, I mean, God's a good parent. He speaks about your actions, not about your person. It's kind of like, um, you know, as parents, when we discipline our children, it's, it's, 
it's, it's right, it's good, it's healthy to say, you know, what you did was wrong, you know, this is the consequence, this is what you need to do to correct it. That's the way it should be. But it's bad, horrible parenting when we start calling our kids names, you know, when we start putting them down. And God doesn't work that way. If you have this loop in your mind where you're, there's these names, where there's these put-downs, that's the enemy. That's never going to be the Holy Spirit. That's living in false condemnation. That's living in false guilt. And the Lord wants to set you free from that. Look at what Romans chapter 8 says, starting in verse 1. What a great, incredible, amazing promise. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. I mean, whatever sin you've committed, it's erased. However many sins we've committed, they're all erased. However terrible of a person we may have been, God's verdict on us in Christ is not guilty. You say, well, how could that be? Well, I, I'm going to show you. We're going to look at some other passages. I'm going to show you. But let's read the rest of this. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according, uh, according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit next week. For the law, which basically means principle in, in this context, for the law, the principle of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did. Those are two awesome, wonderful words. God did. It's finished. You know, when we talk about the finished work of Christ, on the cross, Jesus cried out in the Greek, to tetelestai. And it means it is finished. An accounting term, it means the price is paid in full. It, 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 was, a, it was a stamp that would have been stamped on a, on, a, on a debt that had been discharged. Jesus gave in His life, in His death, a full payment for our sins. God did by sending His own Son. In the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, we've been, you know, talking about the law and how it relates to, to grace and to faith and all these kind of things. And, and, and what we've seen is we can't be made right with God through the law because, number one, the purpose of the law is to show us that we're sinners, not to save us. Number two, to be saved through the law, we would have to perfectly keep it. None of us have done that. So the law brings death, condemnation, separation, and, and it renders it impossible for us to make ourselves right with God. But the good news is, it's what we can never accomplish by keeping the law. God did for us. That's the gospel. That's the difference between Christianity and every religion. God did it. Jesus came. He took our place. And the reason that He could, took our pl he could take our place is because He's God, fully God, but He became a man. And as a man, he never sinned. He kept the law perfectly. And so what that means is, is that his obedience is credited to us when we trust him. So for those of us who have failed to keep the law, it's like we kept it perfectly because we're in Christ and the righteousness of his obedience and perfection, God gives to us. We exchange our sin for His righteousness by faith. God did it. We're, the condemnation is removed because Jesus paid the, the penalty. He served the sentence that should have been incurred upon us instead of Him. That's the best news that you'll ever hear. 
That is the Gospel. That is Christianity. That Jesus died in our place and through His finished work on the cross, through the payment that He made for us, it sets us free from all condemnation. You say, well, how can that be? Well, I want to show you four different Scriptures that, that show you how this works, okay? The first one is 1 John 2, 1 and 2. You can turn there. Or they'll be on the screen. And, and at the end of 1 John chapter 1, um, it talks about how that, you know, we've all sinned. And if, if we say that we haven't sinned, that, that we're a liar. Um, but, but look at what 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have a defense attorney. We have one who pleads our case with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And the key word there is that big word, propitiation. And the, the word propitiate means to appease, to satisfy. What this is talking about, remember one, Romans 1.18? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. Except on the cross, Jesus was our propitiation. He was our atoning sacrifice. And what that means is that the wrath of God, the, the just punishment upon sin, was poured out upon Jesus instead of us. And with God, there's no double jeopardy. So if we're trusting Christ and we're in Him, God has no more anger for us. He has no wrath for us. He has no judgment for us. He has no condemnation for us because Jesus took it all for us. And so, all God has for you is love if you're in Christ. All He has for you it's to, to use the phrase that Shane used earlier, our best interest in mind. That's why he's working everything together for our good. That's why we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I mean, the Bible says God disciplines those that he loves, but even the purpose there is to get us back on the right track, to keep us from missing God's best uh, for our lives. It's not judgment. It's not condemnation. God loves you. He's given you His Holy Spirit. He calls you His child. He, he's blessed you. That's who you are in Christ. There's not anger and judgment and condemnation. And He wants you to believe that. You know, if we see God wrong, we're going to see ourselves wrong. And once we do those two things, we're going to see the world wrong. And then we're going to live wrong. And, and I mean, if you think that God is out to get you and, and God just is up there just waiting to zap you, you've got the wrong view of it. And life's not going to work real well that way. There's no freedom in that. There's no joy in that. There's no peace in that. There's no freedom and joy and peace in trying to make ourselves right with God and trying to appease God. Jesus has already done that for us. That's why that salvation is only through trusting Him and Him alone. All right, so G, number, the first reason that we can be free from all condemnation is because Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. Number two, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look in Galatians chapter 3. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we talked last week. And I'd encourage you, if you weren't here, to find uh, the message on Facebook or on, a web, on the web page because it's such a foundational message. We talked about last week how the old covenant has become obsolete and that we're now living in this new covenant with Christ. And uh, we also we talked a lot about how if we spend much time in East Tennessee, we've probably been in an old covenant church and we tend to still think uh, that way. And so I would encourage you to listen to that. I think it could be a very freeing thing. But maybe what we're going to look at in Galatians here for just, a, just briefly is kind of last week's message in a nutshell, I think. And look at what it says here. Uh, Galatians 3.10. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, let me just stop and say something about this because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. 
The idea of, uh, of the curse here is basically synonymous with judgment or condemnation. Okay? Now, I understand there's different kinds of curses and you know, witches and those kind of things can pronounce curses upon people. That's not the primary meaning or usage in Scripture. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, when Satan tempted Adam and Eve and when they sinned, God's response was to come looking for them, and He gave them grace, but at the same time, He dealt with sin, there were consequences to sin, and God did what? God pronounced curses, right? And there's something called the law of first usage in Bible interpretation, where the first time a word or concept is used, it guides the interpretation of it throughout Scripture, at least as far as with the primary meaning. So, you know, God cursed the ground. And so work's difficult. God cursed childbearing, so childbearing's painful. Marriage is difficult. He cursed the serpent, but at the same time, you know, there's the first messianic promises there. So that's, uh, when you read curse here, understand it as the judgment of God. Okay, and that's important because some of you have heard these teachings about generational curses and, and, and that kind of thing, and... Um, that's not how the Bible uses it. The Bible teaches the concept of personal responsibility. I mean, in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Jeremiah, it basically says, in paraphrase, it says, stop blaming your sin on other people. The soul that sins shall die. We're responsible for ourselves. Okay? So, uh, this, this generational curse kind of thing, and I hope you're going to see this as we read through these verses, it's Old Covenant kind of thinking. He says, For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And he's quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 27. And I wish we had time. We don't. You say, why would you want to really actually even do this? But uh, it, would, it would make this even more powerful, whether you believe it or not. But I wish we could read Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. Because what you have there, and I would even encourage you to read this, because it will help you to understand this. What you have there is a list of sins and God pronouncing curses. And you have a list of righteous things to do, ways for people to obey God. And God pronouncing a corresponding blessing. Now, remember one of the things we looked at last week when we were talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is, is conditional promises based on our obedience. The New Covenant is unconditional promises based on Christ's obedience and our faith in Him. Okay? So, he's quoting there from the Old Testament. But look what he says. He says, but then no one, verse 11 is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. And this is quoting Habakkuk 2.2. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. In, in, in other words, you know, people have a hard time understanding this. Because we kind of, you know, we want to weigh it out on a set of scales and, you know, try to be, have more good than bad. But what he's saying here is that every sin brings a curse. So any sin makes us cursed by God, brings us under the just condemnation of God. So even if you're like a really righteous person, you still fall short. That's why we can only be saved by faith. But here's the good news. Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us. From the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Why? Because it says also in Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why did Jesus die on a cross? He did it to fulfill that Old Testament verse. Nothing is by coincidence. Nothing is by accident in the plan of God. That, verse 14, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit 
through faith. So here's what he's saying. We've all sinned. Sin brings a curse. We, we can never undo that on our own. But the good news is that Jesus was cursed for us, that Jesus hung on a tree receiving uh, the, the punishment that we deserve with the wrath of God being poured out upon Him. And so that in Christ, when we're trusting Him, the curse of sin is removed from us and the blessing of obedience is given then to us. Not our obedience, the blessing of Christ's obedience. That's why the Bible can say that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And so this way, we can live our lives once we get this, not striving to get God to bless us, but realizing that we already have every blessing that we would ever need in Christ Jesus. It's just a matter of trusting Him and thanking Him and obeying Him so those blessings which are in heavenly places can actually be experienced on the earth in our lives. And Do you understand how important that is to the way we live? I mean, it's completely different to live trying to get God to bless us instead of living out of the realization that we're already completely blessed. Even beyond that, if you're a Christian, I want you once and for all to get it out of your mind that there is any kind of curse in your life. I want you to stop listening to people who tell you that you need to go back and dredge up and dig up your past when Jesus has already taken your past to the cross and the Bible says that the handwriting of ordinances, ordinances that was against us, He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to His cross. I want you to stop living under the old covenant and, and stop thinking that you're cursed because of something you've done, something that somebody has done to you, something that somebody else did, something that's happened in your family, in your ancestry, and all those kind of things, and to realize that whatever has happened, Jesus took it to the cross, and that the way that you overcome your past is not by living in your past, not by digging up your past, but by going to Jesus Christ every day day by looking to the cross by realizing that he is fully sufficient that you are complete in him that he has given you the holy spirit that he has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness that you're free in him that there's peace and joy and purpose and forgiveness in him by looking to him every day of your life by fixing your eyes on the glory and the majesty of jesus christ and by burying all this old covenant junk once and for all That's how we live in freedom. And anybody that tells you otherwise is deceived and deceiving you. I don't care what kind of position they have. I don't care what kind of system they're running. Our sufficiency is in Jesus Christ. Now, now don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that there are not things that have happened to us that we have to deal with and those kind of things. I'm not saying to live in denial. I'm just saying those things don't curse you if you're in Christ. There is no curse in Him that has been removed. Number three, Jesus gifts us with the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It's a gift righteousness. It's not an earned righteousness. But what it means is if we're in Christ, we are right with God. Remember the idea of justification? God declares us innocent in Christ. That's our position. But then practically, God doesn't just justify us at the moment of salvation. He regenerates us. He gives us a new heart. He makes us alive on the inside. He indwells us by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we'll look at next week. But the Holy Spirit then gives us the power to actually live a righteous life. 
So it's not just like this facade of us saying, well, I've been forgiven of all my sins, and then, but we, we don't look any different. We don't act any different. We don't think any different. The Holy Spirit transforms us then from the inside out. And then number four, Jesus gives us eternal life. Romans 6.23. The wages. Now we know what a wage is, right? It's what we earn based on what we do. You go to work, you do a certain job, you get paid a certain agreed upon amount. So what he's saying is the wages of sin is death. What we deserve, what we earn for sin is death. There's physical death. God didn't create physical death. It's a result of sin. There's spiritual death. We're separated from God apart from Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2.1. And then if we don't repent and trust Christ, there's eternal death, eternal separation from God in hell. There's death. That's the wages of sin. That's where we are spiritually apart from having a relationship with God through Christ. But, he says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That means we deserve death, condemnation, judgment, but in Christ we're made alive on the inside. We're given a relationship with God. We're made alive forever. So, Let's put all this together. I said the main idea, the thing that I want you to get is just very simply, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How can that be? It can be that way because Jesus absorbed the wrath of God for us. It can be that way because Jesus removed the curse of the law for us. It can be that way because Jesus gave us the blessing of His perfect obedience. It can be that way because Jesus gifts us with the righteousness of God, that we're righteous in His sight, that that's how He sees us in Christ, that He's removed death from us, and He's given us life. That's why that in Christ there's no condemnation, there's no judgment. So I said at the beginning, and this is where I want to end, I said at the beginning that there's two ways that this applies to us. You know, number one, if we're not in Christ, the judgment of God is an objective reality. It doesn't have to be, though. Today, you can see that you're a sinner. You can see that there's nothing that you can do to make yourself right with God. But you can see that there's nothing that you need to do. And you can repent. You can turn from your self-will. You can turn from your self-righteousness. And by faith in Christ, turn your life over to Him, trusting Him and Him alone in His death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, giving your life to Him. And that's what I'd encourage you to do. And what, about, what I want you to know is when that happens, all your condemnation is removed. God acquit, acquits you. He says not guilty. He says you're forgiven. He says you're mine. He, he says I'm never going to be angry with you again. I'm never going to hold your sin against you again because Jesus took it from you for my glory and for your good. And for those of us who are Christians who would say, you know, I'm trusting Christ and I'm going to heaven and I'm forgiven Tomorrow morning, are we going to live like we're forgiven? Tuesday, when something from our past comes up, we're going to live like we're forgiven. We're going to think like there's no condemnation in Christ. When, when Satan tries to play that loop in our minds of all the things that we've done and all the ways that we've fallen short. Are we going to fall for that again? Or are we going to stand on the promise of God that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ? Listen. The more we believe that and the more that we stand on that, the more free we're going to be, the more peace we're going to have, the more joy that we're going to have. The less we believe that, we may be saved, we may really be going to heaven, but we're probably going to be pretty miserable between now and then. 
I mean, what are we going to do with this truth? I mean, it's true. It's an objective reality that if we're in Christ, there's no condemnation. But if we don't believe that, we're not going to experience the blessing of that. So I just want to encourage you to stand on that. In Jesus, you're not guilty. In Jesus, you're not condemned. In Jesus, you're not judged. In Jesus, God's not angry with you anymore. In Jesus, your past is is the past. That God has taken your sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west. That He's placed them in the sea of forgetfulness is how the psalmist said it in poetic language. This means that God does not hold it against you anymore. He says at the end of this chapter, who is it that condemns? And the way He answers His own question is it's Christ who justifies. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how He wants us to live. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Sam, why don't you come and let's, uh, let's sing something in, in a second. So, how does this message hit you? Um, I'll just be honest. I've spoken a lot. I'm usually pretty good at reading a room. I'm not quite sure how to read the room, though, this, this morning. I'm not sure exactly how this is hitting people. Um, what I hoped I would sense was just kind of joy and release and relief. I don't know that I'm really ex- exactly sensing that, though. So I just wonder if that means is some of you are just kind of wrestling with this. I mean, is it really hard to really even accept this? That's where we have to decide if we're going to base our lives on our own feelings or we're going to base our lives on God's Word. Maybe some of you are Christians and there's just something that you just kind of need to... that God's really already taken, but you keep taking back and you need to take it to the cross and leave it there once and for all today. Jesus has dealt with it. He's taken care of it. But if Satan can get you to keep hanging on to it, it's going to keep weighting you down. Can you just give it over to him today? There's some of you. I would imagine that you actually need to take the step this morning of asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Asking Him to come into your life. To be your Lord and Savior. To forgive you, to change you, to make you a child of God. And today, and maybe in the weeks leading up to this, you've heard the gospel. And you know that you're a sinner. You know that you can't save yourself. You believe that in your head. You believe that Jesus is the way to God. But today is the day that you need to act on your faith because it's not just a mental ascent kind of thing, but it's us actually entrusting our lives to Jesus Christ. So I just invite you, just there where you are between you and God, if that's where you are, to ask Mm -hmm. Jesus to forgive you, to ask Him to come into your life. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate just from your heart in faith with you confessing with your mouth that you can't save yourself that you need Jesus in your life that you love him you want to live for him you're thankful for what he's done for you you're thankful that he's taken your guilt and condemnation and judgment away I want to invite you to do something I just want you to sing and just there with their heads bowed and their eyes closed There's some way you need to wrestle with this. There's something you need to do with this. I just encourage you between you and the Lord to do that. If you want to come to the altar, meet with God, you can do that. If you need to talk to me, you want me to pray with you, I'll be here. If, if If you know you need to trust Christ today, but you still got some questions, not exactly sure how that exactly works, come see me right now or after the service, and we'll have somebody take the Bible and uh, walk you through that. 
It's like you're really struggling from your past. You say, I hear this, but I'm just not exactly sure how to apply it. I'm just not exactly sure how to lay this down. It doesn't have to be your past. It could be your present. A church counselor, Dr. Lori Arwood's here. If you need to talk to her after the service, we can set that up for you to be able to do that. So Shane sings. You respond as God would have you to. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I am accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I am accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because. I just ask that the Holy Spirit, God, would take this message and give us the grace to apply it to our lives, and that, Lord, He would bring salvation where it's needed, that He would bring healing and forgiveness where it's needed. Lord, I just ask that this week when we begin to condemn ourselves, that you just bring the words of this scripture to mind, that there is no condemnation in Christ. Lord, help us to live our lives resting in your grace and not striving through our own efforts and our own works. Jesus, we give you glory and praise because of your finished work on the cross and because of your glorious resurrection. We thank you for what you have done for us, for what you're doing in us, and we praise your great name. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, just last thing before you go. Thank you for being here. Appreciate uh, Jim and Misty. Uh, you know, going public, publicly confessing their faith through baptism, it's always an awesome thing. I'd encourage others of you, if you need to do that, to take that step, to let us know through the card in your bulletin, talk to us. If there's something you want to talk about, want to pray about, come and see me or somebody you know afterwards. But otherwise, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.